Oh yeah. So I should preface this by saying that one of the reasons why the Bumble fits me so well is because in the early 2000s, I had a short wheelbase white Range Rover Classic that was called Big White. And everybody knew that truck as being my truck. And, and the thing about Land Rovers is that they, be, they develop a persona in and of themselves that's linked to the owner. So, and I've, I've actually admittedly bought and sold many cars over the years. It's sort of a thing, but, um, but the thing that's always kind of stuck is for some reason Range Rovers. I just, I've had every conceivable type of Rover and I've even had Jeeps, I've had Toyotas. I always end up coming back to Rovers and especially Range Rovers just because I love them. And the cool thing about Range Rovers is there are, if they're in pristine condition, they are still very expensive and they are certainly not very easy to maintain, but the older Range Rover Classics, if they're not in pristine condition, are a really good value. So I had my first Range Rover Big White, I ended, up, I ended up selling because it was rusting. I had driven it too much in the winter time, I didn't undercoat it, and it rusted out. This one, um, the Bumble, I, happened to, I was just cruising on eBay, and I happened to see it two years ago, middle of winter, and it looked exactly, it was literally the same build just about as Big White, and I said, oh my God, the only thing is it was long wheelbase, which I was actually interested in because, and I'll show you why in a moment, because it has enough room in the back to sleep in. And so I, I ended up buying it. I was on the phone with another lawyer actually down in Florida who had just bought it on a whim, just have an off-road vehicle, but it wasn't running right and it had a bunch of problems with it, but it was already built with bumpers and suspension and everything else, and everything I really wanted. Things I actually had, a lot of the same stuff I had on Big White. And so I were on the phone with him and it was only $3,000. I mean, that's pretty amazing to get a running Range Rover Classic, but don't get me wrong, I've put several thousand dollars into it since I bought it. Um, just keeping it running and doing general upgrades and maintenance. I replaced the motor, um, but just going through it real fast. What I try to do, the theme of, I've owned so many Land Rovers and you can kill yourself with expense on it. So the, th the thing to do about Rovers is make improvements that really matter. But I, in my mind, I sacrifice, I'm certainly not, this is no concourse showing vehicle. I sacrifice um, authenticity with the truck for, for, for pragmatism. That's really my thing. If, it, if it's practical and it works, I'm gonna go that direction, um, as opposed to spending all sorts of money to get the authentic item. And just because it works, many times the, the cheaper item can work better. A prime example of that is my winch. <clears throat> this is a tungsten winch, which is a, a standard uh, Chinese winch made in China. But it's, it's awesome, and I'll tell you why. The main reason what you're looking for in a winch is you, you, know, you want it to be, have enough pulling power, you want it to be reliable, but one of the biggest things that's overlooked, especially with American higher-end winches like Warren winch, is that the outspooling, the free spooling is terrible. And you have to actually use the out winch <coughs> outspool to make it go because it's too hard to actually pull the cable out. With a tungsten, it's like, it's like just about fishing, and this has been really cold, but it's super easy just to, just to walk this thing out. My cable's a little bound up. <clears throat> but it makes it so you can just walk away with the winch cable. It makes it great. Plus it comes with a remote. $399 on Amazon, free delivery. You just can't go wrong. And it comes with the synthetic rope. So synthetic rope why, is really- yeah, Why do you go synthetic rope other, <clears throat> other than cable? Synthetic rope is great for one main reason. If it breaks, it generally will just fall to the ground. It doesn't recoil. There is a little bit of recoil. But it, with a steel cable, it comes right back at you and go right through the windshield, and it's just not very safe. So almost everybody's gone to synthetic rope at this point. There are some diehard people who love the steel cables, but um, I've gone to synthetic since it first came out, and I'm just very comfortable with it. Plus, it's easier to handle. You can walk around with it. Um, steel cable gets all bunged up. It also has splinters in it that can they can get you know dig into your hands and go right through your gloves even. Um, but the uh, with, with synthetic rope, it just sort of is, it, it's super easy to handle and it's, and it's very, very strong. I've, I've actually never broken a synthetic rope on a straight line pole. I've only broken them if it's been like a super angled pole where it heats up on an angle, but even that's relatively rare. So, and these are, these are cheap, like, you're gonna, by the end of this thing, you're gonna think I have stock in Amazon, which I wish I did. But, uh, cause everything I get just sort of cheap, these are LED lights from Amazon. Um, the radio, everybody asked me about my antennas. This is a CB antenna. This is ham radio antenna, and yes, I'm licensed. KC1 GIP, <coughs> and uh, that is 
the GMRS, which is also requires a license, but you don't have to have take a test. It's the CB the least. We probably use the ham radio amongst my friends the most. And then we use the uh, GMRS quite a bit too, because that's sort of the way things are going in the overlanding world. Um, most recent upgrades have been the LED lights. You can stay right there, I'll turn them on. So these are badass. These are, these are the Halo LEDs again from Amazon. I had to do quite a bit of wiring to make it so the Halo worked alone with the driving light. So that, that took quite a bit to do, because I've got the little driving light here, but it, I had to link these two together, and I'm, believe me, I'm no electrician, but I was able to do it. Um, so those are really cool, and they're super bright at night. In fact, they're a little too bright. I'm getting blinked at people even when I'm in low beam, and so, but it's awesome because they're, they're really a nice upgrade from the other units, and they use a lot less power, a lot less electricity. These guys I had to spend on. Nobody is making an aftermarket LED Range Rover Classic light. These come from a company in England. You can find them on eBay. So if you go on eBay and you Google Range Rover Classic LED side lamps, you're gonna get these. They're not cheap though. They're, they're a good couple hundred dollars for each set. So for the front, you got like $200. And then for the back, you've got like 200 bucks. My neighbor Jerry is gonna come up and uh, join us. Little weird add-ons people ask me about. The holes in the hood, I do this because in the summertime when I'm wheeling, the newer 4.6 engine that we put in, it does get hot. It doesn't heat up temperature-wise internally, but it just kicks out a ton of heat. So what we do is we, we uh, I just, I did this with my old truck too, and it's amazing. You walk by this in the summertime and there's just heat pouring out of these things. So it really does a great job in keeping the heat out. <clears throat> this, these are actually Jeep JK clips and I noticed on the highway this was fluttering a little bit even though it does have the emergency clip but heaven forbid that let go in and of itself because what would happen is my high lift jack would come back and go right through the windshield and I would be no more so I ended up getting these really inexpensive things again on Amazon these are like 40 bucks or something and I just drilled them in and installed them and they work great so this is a little uh, a Jeep thing and so and I have no, no issues using any brand of stuff um, as long as it works. So moving back, I do, this is a little bit controversial actually. A lot of people say you're not supposed to put the high lift jack on your, on anything on the external part of the vehicle because if there's a major accident, this thing could come undone. I have to tell you that the way this is bolted in and reinforced with these massive bolts, the whole entire hood would have to come off, which could happen admittedly, but it'd be so doubtful It'd be such a catastrophic accident that I'm gone anyway. So this is, well, a lot of people say this is bad. If you hit something head on, this could, this could fly out or it could come back at me, but it's bolted on so securely that I seriously doubt that's gonna happen. I actually, the high lift jack is something I use very rarely. The only reason why I actually keep it with me is because this is an easy place to keep it. I do keep it bathed in oil. I use wax, um, <clears throat> a kind of wax oily spray to be able to put it on fluid film is, is what it's called and it, it, it's, it's an undercoating but I, I use it to lubricate this guy because if they get rusty they're useless. Um, this is a last resort implement with, with high lift jacks. I, it's a farm jack, it is, it is very useful, it has, it has its place but I, I only use it as a last resort because it's a really, really dangerous thing to use. They, they, if, they're, if they can, they, can they, they, have, they store a huge amount of energy and if they unload at the wrong time, they can hurt people. And I've, I've actually firsthand have seen that happen years and years ago and it was not pretty. So, but I do keep it on me because it is, does come in handy. It also looks badass, I have to admit. Everybody loves the way it looks. People have stopped me, they thought it was a gun, um, which kind of, I guess, can look like that. But, um, but it looks kind of cool, so I keep it up there. Just moving our way back, this is where an old snorkel was that I cut out. You're gonna see there's a lot of like, if I can tape it over and that works, that's what I do. I don't care so much about the aesthetics as long as the vehicle generally looks okay. Like I had a ton of, but one of the bad things about Range Rover Classics is it has its own ECU for the, has, a, has its own brain for just the windows to work. It was one of the early, early super smart windows in a vehicle where it could it would, it would remember, it had memory where you put it before, and it's just a mess. So I'm constantly fiddling with these windows, and 
eventually I like to put a hand crank or something in, but I take off the, the door card so much, I finally just said screw it, and I put my beloved zip tape, which I use on everything, I just put that over just to provide a little bit of sound deadening and insulation. I have uh, just super practical stuff. I mean, people love to look at the vehicle because I, this is a bicycle water bottle cage that I use. I have them on, I have them all over the vehicle actually, in the, in the back and over here. Um, normal seats, but I do have seat covers that a buddy gave me for this that didn't fit his vehicle. One cool thing is I have the old fashioned Land Rover. This is an old Defender steering wheel. They actually do have a middle one that does say Range Rover, which I'm looking for. But this is kind of cool. It just gives you a better feel than the Range Rover Classic um, thing. And the only drawback on this is I, it has no automatic shut off for the blinkers, but that's fine with me. You can see all my radios. I just basically just bolted them on and you know and and Velcroed things on top of it just to keep it practical. You know, as long as they all work, and, which they generally do. Um, some work better than others, and radios are never perfect. But they do work well. We use the ham radios for all the bicycle events, which is great. And I've taken out, if you notice, like the dash. There was tons of dash with lots of extra wiring and things like that. And I've gone through that wiring like I did with my previous vehicle. I just took it all out. Because the less, the less that's there, usually the better. You can go wrong with that for sure. And again, I'm no electrician. I probably have done things not quite right. But it seems to be OK. Um, and it's really, really attractive on the other side because there's so much more room for the passenger there. Uh, the iPad, which is what we live by for all the navigation we do, um, ride with GPS for the bicycle events, and Avenza PDF maps, which is what we use for the town highway reading. Um, of course, the obli obligatory disco ball, which comes in handy at night when you're at the party. Um, actually looks really cool. I mean, it's a bummer it's not nighttime. Um, getting into the rear of the vehicle, most used tool of all time, absolute most used tool, the steel chainsaw. And we'll use it today for sure. There's no doubt we will, we will. One of the things that we do in the food chain of driving class four roads in Vermont is we are the guys who actually clear the trees. I mean, I, the snowmobile clubs do it a lot, but they usually just do it in the fall when they're getting ready for their season. We do it year round. You know, when we're, well not year round, because we really don't do much in the winter. But <clears throat> during the season we're out there, whenever there's a tree down, it's our responsibility because the horseback riders and the cyclists, of which I'm one as well, um, you, you can't carry a chainsaw. So this makes it so I keep it right here front and center, I keep it sharp, I keep it, I keep it fueled up, and I use it all the time. Um, this is sort of my kitchen area when we're camping, and I keep things really minimal. I've got a, my age-old beloved Engel fridge. This is a Swiss-made fridge, and you can keep this guy on and keep the truck not even running for f several days. And as long as it's on a low enough um, setting, it'll keep everything really cold. When the truck is running, it's no problem. It stays charged up. And you, the key to that is that it uses really very little electricity. So it has very little draw on the vehicle, and it also just keeps stuff wonderfully cold. And you can actually keep stuff frozen if you want to. So that's where I keep like beer and things and, and, and perishable items when we're camping. I do keep a lot of food stuff in here, but I, you know, I don't go for long periods of time. It's almost always like a night or two, just overnight camping, which is what we do in Vermont. So this is sort of the kitchen area. My, you know, my towels, my, my, uh, my paper towels, and just anything I need that's. It's right there. I'm constantly stopping to swim in ponds, so I keep my my. Uh, this is this is an, an homage to my New Jersey upbringing, the Birdwell breeches, which is what we always wore on the Jersey Shore. So I keep my surf trunks in here. I keep my my Crocs, the SpongeBob on it. <laughs> so I keep those always on because I'm always stopping to jump in a in a river or jump in a in a pond, which is we have a plethora of that stuff in Vermont. It makes it a delightful thing, especially when it's really hot in the summer. It's so great to stop. Keep my first aid kit right here with my Blue Ridge uh, gear right here. The uh, this awesome pouch, which is Velcro. So if anything happens, I'm right there and I can just tear this guy off and I can walk away with it. I do. I do. I have modified this and I keep mainly band aids and stuff I use all the time, neosporin things when I just cut myself. Um, a lot of headlamps. I have my high lift jack base, but I use that more for my normal Land Rover jack, which is awesome. All my air down things, which we're going to use in a moment. These are just devices that actually pull the, this pulls the valve <coughs> out of the, uh, out of anybody who's a wheeling enthusiast knows what this is, but it basically captures the valve stem when you're airing down and makes it so it's super easy and accurate. 
the dare down, and then of course the gauge. Um, moving to the back, these really robust bumpers, this all came with the truck. These are all Rover Time, which was a great company back in the day. They made, in the early 2000s, late 90s, they made the best of the best. They still exist. Um, they're still doing some stuff, and I understand they're coming back. They have new owners, but uh, but this is the this was the stuff to have. This is the rear version of those English LED lights. Um, let's see. Okay. So one of the things I do, just stupid stuff, a lot of other guys who have big vehicles like this, they have swing away tire carriers on the back, which isn't bad to have. That is kind of nice, but I, I, I get in and out of this thing so much. One of the best things about a Range Rover is the tailgate. If you have a Discovery, no tailgate. If you have um, even an LR3 or LR4, the tailgate's kind of half because it's scalloped, but with a Range Rover, it is the best. You can cook on this, you can sit on it. The first thing you do when you stop on the trail and you're hanging out with people, pull the tailgate down and you, everybody's back here. And it's the perfect height for cooking on. It's great for like, you know, you can, you can fix stuff on it and I put a tarp out and we can, I've got a little pad I can use when I'm doing repairs and I make a work, you know, workshop out of it. Um, it's just awesome. I keep in the back here, we'll get to the cot in a minute, but I keep all of my recovery gear in this dry bag. So it can be raining and nasty and stuff like that and everything stays nice and dry. I've got all my kinetic ropes. A kinetic rope is this is this sort of elastic rope that's super good for recovery. It packs a wall up, and, and, but it's a, still a soft recovery. So you can pull somebody out and it, it just, it, it, it magnifies the pulling strength. Of course I keep toilet paper when I have to get out. Always, if you're gonna do, if you're gonna be going to the bathroom in the woods, carry a little shovel. This one's great, super sharp. Pooper you can get scooper. this pooper scooper. Um, I carry a little bag that I usually take with me for trail trash. That's another responsibility we have on the trail. And I give these away at the bird watching safari to everybody who registered. And they, we actually put these on the back of the vehicles and they're awesome because they kind of drain out. They're basically a potato bag, but they work super well. And I've had that one for years. This is a recent thing that Kim got me, this awesome little pickaxe. A lot of times there might be situations on the trail where you need to dig something out or it's really great for at camp uh, making firewood. So you split wood with this guy, which is awesome. So I keep that tucked right in, keep it handy. Um, looking if you can get it in there. This guy is my spare box. So I've got a sp spare as many things as I can fit in there. I've got spare belts, spare plugs, spare alternator i've got a spare water pump um i've got everything that's kind of a consumable item in a range rover that it's bound to go through as a spare because they do we do go through it so there's lots of stuff in there and i try to keep that as compact as i can and i sort of limit that's my limit as to the amount of spares i can take uh i've still got i've got my tools over here so this is like a just handy dandy toolbox and none of this stuff is expensive guys none of it is i try to keep everything save your money for the adventure and i try to keep everything stuff that's like if it's on sale on amazon or on sale at harbor freight that's what i use and because there's always other guys out there who have stuff too you don't have to carry everything but the kitchen sink in fact i have a fairly firm rule that unless it's a safety item like like a first aid kit or anything related to that and with, with some exceptions that i do carry if i haven't used something in a year it doesn't make the cut if I haven't used it in a full season of wheeling, it just doesn't make the cut because then I'm not going to use it unless it's a safety item that needs to be there no matter what. But by and large, I, I really cull through everything every winter and I take out stuff that is just stuff I've not been using because it just takes up space. It's so easy to accumulate. It's so easy to just keep, oh yeah, that looks handy, that looks cool. That's going to look really good at my campsite when somebody looks in my vehicle, but in the end, if you haven't used it, it's just not, it's not good to carry because it just adds weight and it adds clutter and you want to keep the trucks fairly, um, you know, fairly leaned out as far as gear goes. Cause there's just, if something happens, you roll over, you never know. You just, you don't want to have stuff stacked all over the place. I use all these soft shackles. You know, these are just various ones that I've collected. Some are better quality than others, but they've all worked great. Um, this is just a way to, instead of using a, a D-ring shackle, which still it still is a great tool, these just are a lot, lot handier and they take up less weight. Um, the bed, this is the thing. So with the Bumble, it just barely, I am able with, a, with a, just a standard military cot, which I took the ends off of, I am able to sleep in the Bumble and I am super comfortable. So I've got this foam mattress 
that I got again on Amazon super cheap and I use a regular Boy Scout Coleman Boy Scout bag and I also have a heater I've got a Mr. Heater heater that I put in the front if it's winter but this is generally my setup for the summer Violet is able to walk to and fro on the cot so she loves it she can see out the back she curls up on this thing during the day in the sun um, but another thing it does I'll go over here <coughs> is this is my main cargo area so i've got all my camping gear in this bin i've got my fluids right there but what i've what i've done with the old seat belts is i fasten those here so the cot is stuck down the cot is fastened so anything underneath it is going to stay there so if the truck were to roll on its side or even roll heaven forbid roll all the way over everything underneath it's going to stay there for by and large so that's another reason for the cot is that it contains all this gear heavy duty gear that's underneath it um, this is where I keep chairs. I've got a bunch of spares in this old box. This is uh, actually not spares, but tools. This is a lot of tools and my um, and my, and my uh, beloved Land Rover bottle jack, which I use religiously instead of using the Highland. It also provides a perfect base for the front part of the of the cot. Um, this is my co my coffee kit. I love coffee, so I'm, I'm always I've had other videos on YouTube where I've just done the coffee kit and people. Love it. The best coffee maker for camping right here. The old Italian coffee maker. So I use, you know, a fairly state-of-the-art camping stove, which just folds super small. So I've got that guy. And then this can use propane from a bigger tank, or you can use the small jet-powered jet fuel stuff. And this makes it really easy. This is the isobutane fuel and then I use just regular old espresso the old Medaglia Doro and it just works perfectly it cooks up in no time and you can do this on the trail um, <clears throat> so I keep that super handy because I'm always making coffee on the trail and various oh this is another stupid simple thing when you're camping a lot of people say why do you sleep so well during the night I mean one of the things is I have a comfortable cot the other thing is I have a pee bottle I know this sounds ridiculous. The pee bottle is crucial because it keeps you from having to get up, especially at 50 years old. I have to go to the bathroom at night, so it keeps you from having to get out of bed. You simply roll over, you put this down there, you go into it, and I actually open the door and just dump it out. And it is the best. So I've got one of these for water for hydrating afterwards, and I've got a wide mouth one to pee into, and it's just a game changer. Which is rich. Yeah, right. So it's like, it just makes it, you know, super easy. I've never, I've come close, but I've never actually filled one up. But it's just great. Uh, little stupid things, these little lights, these LED lights, I've got them all over the truck. And they're great. They, they still last during the cold, cold that this thing stores in. Um, and if they, the batteries go, you can just replace the batteries. Those are awesome. And I'll show you the front. The, uh... Here's Violet in the sunspot. So here's, it's ridiculous. Now we're getting into the ridiculous stuff. This is a, an office organizer, which work great because you can put wet gloves in this thing and the heat from the vehicle will actually dry them out. You know, I keep keep all my hats and things in these office organizers. Um, this is where the air conditioning system used to be, but we took all this out because it's just useless. I'm not going to use the AC anyway. And it wasn't even working, the compressor. So it just, it was tons of stuff right here that just took away from weight, but added a lot of storage and just a lot of, a lot of, and I actually keep my ARB, my, um, the, the compressor for my lockers, for the Ashcroft lockers, if you look underneath there, it's tucked right in, so it's high and dry and it's inside and I can troubleshoot it. There's a lot of people keep those in vulnerable places where they get covered in dirt. That's just not a good idea. Um, you know, my ECU is easy to get to without all this stuff. So. When you're looking after the vehicle all the time, it's nice to have this stuff accessible. And that's really, that's about, I keep all these little radios. So the GMRS radios, you can always hand these out to people. So this way everybody's got a radio in the group. Of course, the lighting. <laughs> it's just stupid stuff. So the idea is to make it sustainable. And that's the thing, guys. It's so, what happens to a lot of Rover enthusiasts, they get overwhelmed. They buy the truck. They usually pay too much. Then they're maintaining it. And if you're, you know, you're married with kids and everything, it becomes, it just becomes, you can't justify it. You're like, I'm not going to keep throwing money into something. But the cool thing about Rovers, especially the older V8s, is that the parts are really plentiful. Like you can, not only do we have Atlantic British, Rovers North, 
DAP, all these local part purveyors for new parts, but we've also got any, any of these, you can put it out there on Facebook and within an hour, there's gonna be somebody who has a used part. So you can find all these parts for these things. Even there are some that are no longer available, the NLA parts, but there, I've always, I, there's not been one, I think there's one transmission line that I have yet to find a secondhand part, but I've got two guys who can make me them from scratch. I just need to keep the truck down long enough and I have only a slight leak, so it's, it's not bad. Um, but the idea is that, you know, you can, if you stay on top of things, you can, and, and the other thing about rovers is, it always tells you, a rover, I shouldn't say always, I would say 99% of the time, a rover, that will give you a symptom, that will give you a tell that there's something wrong. And as long as you obey that tell, as long as you say, okay, this thing is, it's telling me something, and you look into it right away, most of the time you can nip it right away. And in fact, a lot of the things, I'm no mechanic, but a lot of the things, I've got my next door neighbor, Jerry, here. A lot of the things we, I'll just call Jerry, and he'll come over and help me fix it, and we can do it right in my garage. Um, or you go over to, like, I've got neighbor's house who have heated garages and beautiful shops, and we go over there and fix it. So there's just a lot of expertise out there. And being a, in the Rover community, there's just, people are so willing to help. You know, it's such a close-knit community, and there's so many of these around that, um, and, and the other cool thing about Rovers is they kept the same parts for years and years and years. Like this one, even though it's a 94, uses the same alternator. I have it rigged up to use the same alternator as an 87 through 92 Range Rover. And that's like every one of them. And you can buy those alternators at Napa if need be. So it's it makes it easier. It's never gonna be super easy. It's a very old vehicle. It's 25 years old. But it still is something that it keeps it fun and part of the camaraderie and the joy of ownership is actually repairing things when it needs it. So that makes it doable. Um, so that's kind of why I stay with them. You know, I've had other vehicles, I've had G wagons, I've had the Jeep later, the late model Jeeps and stuff, and they're all great vehicles. But for some reason, I always come back to these, and I really, it's like, just like gravel. It's like, like gravel grinding, it's the camaraderie that keeps me coming back. People ask me what the lift is in this truck, and it's a really simple lift. Basically, it's just a bigger, coil spring. So this is a six inch rover time coil spring lift, um, which I'm not actually even sure if you can get anymore, but it was the standard sort of lift. And it has the rover time heavy duty control arms. And it's got, um, everything's caster corrected for the, so that, so that the drive shafts are at the right angle. Um, and then I run a 31575 R16 BFG KM3. This is the new KM3. Um, I had the KM2s on before this. I do like these tires. They, I like them. I like the BFGs because they have really great sidewall protection. And a lot of times in Vermont, we've got rocks and roots and things like that. The drawbacks to the KM3 is I don't think they're as good in ice and snow as like a Cooper STT Pro and other mud terrains that have more siping but they're still really respectable. They're very, very good in ice and snow when you air them down to the level I am. The drawback for that is that I'm, I have to air these down to like in, in, in tough conditions like today to eight to 10 PSI, which I can get away with because I've got an eight inch, it's stuffed onto an eight inch Land Rover aluminum rim, which are just awesome. Great beadlock without having to have actual beadlocks. The one thing to note about the KM3, which I've noticed, um, and I've seen this online as well, they are shorter. They're short. They're, they're they're not as tall as the KM2 in the same size, and they're wider. I don't know why they did this. It's it's just not good. It's the only thing I don't like about them because they are they are a solid half an inch lower as far as height, and they're about a half an inch wider. So you're going to get increased rubbing, and you're not going to get the height that you really wanted. Or like you know, you're, this truck is geared to have 35s. This is really a, a kind of a kind of a big 34, you know, it's a little over 34, so not good on that. I don't know why that is, but I've seen like Andrew St. Pierre White said the same thing, is that his cam 3s are wider and they were rubbing and his cam 2s weren't. Um, and I've checked with other people who have bought cam 3s they're brand new on the market, um, and they've, they've experienced the same thing, is I don't know why BFG did that, but I'm willing to live with it because it's a great tire. I may not, if I, when I get ready to replace these, I may go back to another standard size 315 75 R16. Um, but basically it's all rover time stuff. 
it's so high up, there's so much clearance with the rover, I don't even run rock sliders. I don't, I almost never touch the, the rockers. Um, it's got so much clearance, you can just walk underneath this thing, and that's only with really a big 34. That's all it is, it's not a 37 or a really, really, you know, standard, very large tire. So, that's it, it's easy, easy stuff. So this is the this is my spiel about sleeping and camping. Um, I've camped a million different ways. I've had rooftop tents. I've had ground tents. I've had tent cots. I've had a bunch of different things. But if you can manage it, and I realize a lot of vehicles you can't. Like a smaller Jeep, you just can't sleep in the truck. Except like I am Jake manages to do that, which is incredible because he doesn't have a front seat. But if you can sleep in the truck, there are so many advantages. And the main advantage is. You're, you're in an insulated vehicle already. You're off the ground, which you, which you wanna be. <clears throat> but for me, I get a feeling of security when I'm sleeping and that I don't get if I'm in a tent. If, if I'm in a tent, for some reason, my subconscious will not actually relax for the night. I am, I am constantly waking up. The, the slightest little noise outside, and I see this all the time at our events. You, we have a guy, uh, Peter Heinegger, who runs, who has coffee going at five in the morning because there are 20 guys lined up at five in the morning who basically have been staying up all night. They, they just don't sleep. At VOT last year, <clears throat> the guy who was in first place on day three actually cracked, and in one of the rules of VOT is you have to camp with a group and he was he was leading. He had zero points. Was leading the was going to win, and he cracked and went to a hotel because he had not slept in three nights. And he was like, I can't do it anymore, Peter. I just can't sleep. And one of the things he, he of course was trying to sleep in a tent. Nothing against tent camping, but when you're sleeping inside the vehicle, it gives you this tremendous sense of security. For one, you kind of know, like consciously, you know that if the shit hits the fan and there's something going wrong, you can jump into the driver's seat and drive away. Not that that's ever happened to me, but there is just this feeling of security knowing that I can do that. The other thing is when it rains or there's windy, which happens a lot, you know, it rains, and sometimes it rains like really badly or there's wind, you don't have this rooftop tent flapping all night that keeps you awake. I noticed like Chris Sean's a good friend of mine, you know, a lot of times he's like, oh, if it was windy last night, I couldn't sleep. Even though he does technically kind of sleep in the vehicle because he has the Ursa Minor clamshell that just, it just pops up. It's actually a slick setup. I, if I was ever gonna have a rooftop type of tent situation, that's what I would have. But even his has a canopy on the outside that forms the tent that flaps and that keeps you awake. So with this thing, it's like in the summer, I can have both windows open. I have, I have just some simple netting that goes over the windows. They provide me with phenomenal cross breeze. So I stay cool. I even have a little tiny fan that I can do if it's really hot. In the winter time, I can put a heater inside the truck and I have the full catalytic Mr. Buddy heater, which is a great tent heater. Put that in the truck and I am toasty comfortable all night long. Um, but the biggest thing is, if you can manage it, sleep in the truck. And, and the best thing is, here's the, when you get to camp, you're not spending a half an hour, 45 minutes, an hour setting up your campsite. You're, you're, you know, I'm, I, if it takes me more than a minute to be completely ready to go to sleep, and usually that is setting up like the pee bottle and the water bottle, and that's it. And I make my coffee so it's readily available in the morning, and then I have a beer in my hand and I'm socializing. That's all I have to do. That's what I like to do. So that's my, that's my sleep in your truck uh, speech that I try to, that I try to tell everybody if you can do it. Some people you just can't, there's no way the vehicle can, can accommodate it, but um, for me it dictated what vehicle I bought because I knew I wanted to sleep in the truck.